My conversation today is with author, lecturer, and Freemason, Chuck Dunning. Chuck's work in the field of contemplative practices and his reflections on esoteric Freemasonry are in a class all their own. His books, Contemplative Masonry and The Contemplative Lodge, have become classics of the modern esoteric and associated movements within the Freemasonic fraternity. And his latest work, A Rose Qua Oratory, Rosicrucian Reflections and Resources from a Knight of the Eagle and Pelican, is a stunning treatise on self-directed inner work, utilizing symbols and systems from within the Western esoteric traditions. Hearing his perspectives always leaves me refreshed and inspired, as many who know him would likely agree. Chuck and I took some submissions on topics for discussion, which ended up facilitating an in-depth conversation about Freemasonry, esoteric symbolism, the divine feminine, and much more. It's always a privilege to speak with Brother Chuck, and he remains a generous and insightful pillar of light within the craft. I'm Ike Baker, and this is the Arcanum Podcast. Brother Chuck Dunning, I'm so happy that you joined me um, this afternoon for, for a chat. I know you and I have spoken a few times um, sort of off the record, and uh, they've definitely been a few of my favorite conversations. So I'm excited to see uh, what we get up to today. Ike, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've been following your work since you came online, and I really appreciate the way you address a lot of the topics that you do about masonry and mysticism and uh, magic and the Western esoteric tradition. Yeah, I think you do a really good job with those things, so it's an honor here for me to be in this with you and part of it. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, it's part of what I do, I guess, is following in the footsteps of people like yourself who open the door, you know, um, to things like, uh, you know, contemplative masonry with your work and and um, fostering a community of people, you know, uh, really encouraging us in that direction where it's like, you don't have to be afraid of this, you know, like it's totally mm, okay yeah. okay to talk about. So I don't think I could really be as vocal without people like yourself and and brothers like uh, Jamie Paul Lamb and, and others who have really opened the door for esoteric discussion. So one of the cool things, probably the coolest, this is the coolest little project I've done so far, is that we've opened this up today to some questions from brethren and social media followers. Um, and they've certainly supplied some really interesting topics for us to discuss. But before we dive into that, uh, I actually wanted to talk to you about uh, something you and I have discussed, again, off the record, we've touched on, I think it'd be really interesting to get into somewhat today, the notion of duality and non-duality. You know, um, mm. I wondered I wondered if we might explore that a bit more. I guess, you know, this whole idea of non-dual experience and 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 what that's like for you and and what practices towards that have been. And and I guess to tack on to that, um, do you feel that non-dual experience is what the symbolism of Western esotericism, for instance, Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, are sort of eventuating in? Are they pointing to that? Yeah, that's a great question, Ike. Um, so I think first we should probably clarify the way we're using these terms, because I know that some people are not fans of the term non-dual, um, and for different reasons, you know. Um, the way that I use the term non-dual is to express basically um, what's in philosophical terms is often called panentheism. And that is the idea that the divine is completely present all the time, everywhere and everything. And yet there's also, there are also aspects or an aspect of the divine that transcends space and time and is beyond our ability to uh, recognize and experience as separate entities. Um, so non-dualism then within that context means that in a transcendent way, everything is one thing. Um, 
and multiple expressions of the potentials of that one thing within it. Um, and, um, and so we're not, as the term non-duality suggests, you know, that we are negating duality. We're not negating the experience of duality, of its relative reality, but we are saying that it doesn't define the essential nature of, of being, of existence. It rather is a way of defining how we experience the essential nature of existence is through multiplicity and through duality. Um, so I can kind of think that's where I'd like to start is with that way of understanding those terms. How does that work for you? Great. I mean, that's that's a, a, a very eloquent way of articulating that. I think that's perfect. Um, thank you. And so to your question about are these traditions, these Western esoteric traditions like Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism, Hermetic Kabbalah and so on, are they pointing us in the direction of non-dualistic experience of something that, that helps us realize, make more real um, this, um, the state of consciousness in which we know in a non-sensory kind of way, that all things are one. Uh, I, I think so. I, I think that these traditions are all pointing us in that direction. And I would say that there are two different kind of categories of what we might call experience. And I, I, I'm going to have to hedge all this. And I know I've seen you do this. And so I know you understand how you have to say up front this disclaimer of these dualistic terms never really capture what it is we're trying to talk about. We're only pointing in the direction of them. But so one category of experience is a kind of noetic experience within duality, within multiplicity itself, in which you sense at a deep intuitive level, oh, this is all one. And it's like becoming lucid in a dream when you realize, oh, I'm in a dream. I am awake within a dream and the dream is happening and I just know it, right? The same thing can happen at this other level where you just know that about your physical social existence. But then there's this other class of experience and you can't, you can't even say that it's a class in the sense that there are multiple forms of it, but it's what might, it, it, uh, Robert Casey Foreman called it the pure consciousness event. And other people have used other terms for it, but it's this moment of singular consciousness in which all duality of a knower and a known and the process of knowing, all of that goes away. There's just simply this transcendent, whatever you want to call it, God, the one, uh, truth whatever, and and there's no sensory way to describe it. There's no sensory experience involved in it. There's no logical processing or reflection of any kind happening. It's, it is definitely a class by itself. Like I said, you, you can't even really call it an experience because there's no experiencer. There's just... So you can see the the ludicrous uh, effort here that I'm making to yeah. try to talk. About. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that's the thing, right? I mean, you have to try and talk about it because we we can only use these words as a scaffolding for the greater work, right? For, for yeah, it, they're just a scaffolding, but they they can be very useful. Um, you know, I always go back to the ancient Greek stuff, which I know you and I have spoken about your introduction to Platonism, which is kind of where we we really, I think, first 
were introduced to to each other and we mm-hmm. started talking it, it, and you had a, a very fortunate experience with being introduced to the platonic stuff early on from the right perspective and uh, <laughs> or at least what i think is the right perspective right but um uh yeah. the whole idea of mantia you know um divine mm-hmm. madness and all these yes. different kinds of divine madness and one having to do with divination and the other one having to do with henosis and and things like that but it's what I find really interesting is in this modern um, kind of, and I bring this up just so that we can kind of throw light on it and clarify it based on experiences, because there's just a lot spoken about in terms of this, as we say, non-dual experience. And I know that you know panentheism is the best way to describe it, really, and I had not thought of that. Um, mm. But <laughs> it's... Um, it's not this permanent state, you know, I feel like everybody thinks you're going to have that experience and then the ledger of life will be wiped <laughs> clean. You know, yeah. If anything, it calls you to like pay attention and redress the, the you know, the, the, the imbalances, the, the, the ledger book of life, but it's not going right. to. It's not going to make you this, um, you know, like you start floating on water and I'm a very calm person now because I've <laughs> seen behind the veil. No, you know, that kind of madness, it's untenable as a, as a, as a permanent state. You, you know, you won't be able to function. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that, that kind of madness has different effects on different people. Um, you know, uh, there's the, you know, the, the very often cited a uh, story about the 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 kabbalists you know that had this direct experience with uh the great mystery and you know so it goes that you know one of them dies one of them goes mad one of them only one of the bunch right is able to come back and um from that and and in a way that is you know he's able to function and seem relatively normal <laughs> but uh but when you come back from that kind of experience, it carries with it a completely different perspective. You as a human being aren't instantly transformed, as you correctly noted. I mean, you know, you don't become some sort of angelic being from that point forward. You know, you're still a human being. You just have a different perspective now on things. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, you have to relearn um, how to be in the world, you know? Um, yes. And, and it's, it's almost like, uh, it becomes a struggle to sort of course correct these automatic, you start noticing the knee jerk responses you reacted to everything with, you know, it's yes. really, it creates this, this, it delaminates is what I like to call it. The, um, the observer and the experience so that mm. you're able to get this space between, you know, the thing that pisses you off and then the way that you react or, you know, any other variety of emotion. Um, and, and from there, you know, you have to sort of relearn how to operate these, these things, which have been around you your whole life, but you're kind of seeing now for the first time. Yeah. So one of the ways I would sum up what you just described is that this new perspective on, on, on the nature of being, it gives you automatically gives you a fresh perspective and a, and a different understanding of the mechanics of of how the world works and manifestation and duality and multiplicity and you begin to realize oh okay so this is the way this works and i can engage with this more directly now to to change this reality right the one that i'm most immediately in contact with and uh and as i do that then it sends ripple effects out because everything is interconnected it sends ripple effects out into everything else yeah i i wonder you know if I mean, I, I can only I can only guess at your your potential answer, but I mean, what are the ways that you you find yourself struggling with dualistic thinking? I think for me, just right, I'll start with, well, I'll I'll go naked first. Is um, uh, doubt, you know, self uh, self doubt and and overarching doubt. It's I mm-hmm. am you know I consider myself to have 
experienced a form of gnosis that we're talking about here. But but there's for some reason it's I can't I still need to sort of use that buckler against doubt that just it seems built into our society. Yeah. So let me just ask a follow-up question on that, and I, t I promise we won't turn this into an analysis session. Um, when you say doubt, are you specifically speaking of doubt about your noetic experience, or are you speaking of doubt in terms of just self-doubt in general? What, where are you with that? I would say self-doubt. You know, I would I would say one of those things that has, and it's funny because I rail against it, right? Because I wanna I wanna pump people up. I want to give them the affirmation. That it's like, yeah. just because you've had the, it, you know, just because you can't communicate some of these experiences doesn't mean that you're crazy. Um, so, and, and essentially. No, it actually probably means you're sane. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so that's one of the ways that I, I feel, I still, though I'm very, I seem very confident about it. You know, I am not immune to doubt. I know how to deal with yeah. it. I know how to push yes, through, yes. but I'm not immune yeah. to to self-doubt. Like, you know, um, yeah. why? How, like one of the things that I constantly find myself, you know, brushing my teeth or something, I look at my look at myself in the mirror and it's like, what gives you the balls to <laughs> go out there and tell people <laughs> to talk about this? You know? <laughs> yes, I do know. So yes, I can relate like uh, to that kind of self doubt. Um, I would say that just the years of maturation. Uh, within this new perspective, kind of help ameliorate some of that and, and resolve some of that uh, as I continue my own process of reintegration and regeneration, you know, that, that that's less and less of an issue. But it becomes replaced by not what you might think as this greater level of kind of like uh, it doesn't become replaced with as much kind of hubris, although there's a phase at which that can happen. And sometimes it still emerges that, you know, I feel very right and self-assured. Uh, and usually that's a mask over a deeper insecurity or self-doubt of some kind. Um, but it gets instead replaced with this kind of awareness of just my basic humanity and that it's okay for me to be struggling and to uh, uh, to be, you know, doing the best that I can, as ultimately I believe we really all are. Um, now, the way that I kind of, I, I think, to paraphrase what I think you were asking me the way that I kind of struggle with my own humanity mostly at this point is well let me just say this anybody who thinks that they've got themselves totally squared away and very balanced and harmonious and very well integrated um, I would I would suggest that they just pay attention to what their behavior is like behind the wheel of a car uh, because the most well-adjusted human beings that I have ever met in my life are the, are still very likely to lose their temper behind the wheel of a car and say and do things that don't reflect a very loving and forgiving spirit of humanity. Um, and that taps into the thing for me is that in my process of self-realization to kind of borrow that language from another stream, um, what I discovered is that the word that most encapsulates the light that I am drawn to serve is love. And, um, and what I am continually confronted with, therefore, is how poorly I serve that light of love. And, um, uh, and how I can continue where there are opportunities, challenges for me to continue to make myself a, a more fitting instrument for that. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I totally relate to and understand those words. I think a lot of people, if they're honest with themselves, uh, you know, I mean, we can always be doing better, but uh, 
it's you know it is an extension of that eros you know that philosophical love which is yes. which was which was meant to connote right yearning the way you yearn for your lover with your heart you yearn for god and that's that kind of as i've heard um said before uh that gnostic itch that 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 has us <laughs> reaching towards the unknown towards the ineffable but um yeah i i i would agree with you um 110 is like you have to translate that to a personal level and mm -hmm. and not you know right we know that we serve god best when we serve uh each other and 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 that's kind of um that i think is the challenge to people who follow mm -hmm. uh well really any spiritual path but particularly me as as somebody who considers themselves like more into mystic and gnostic levels of of christianity much more along i guess you would also we'd also say the the rosicrucian current or egregore mm -hmm. right to heal mm -hmm. the sick and that gratis um that's something that i definitely uh I definitely struggle with. But speaking of uh, of Rosicrucianism, you obviously, I mean, you put out a book, Ro a Rose Qua Oratory. Uh, the full title is Rosicrucian Reflections and Resources from a Knight of the Eagle and Pelican. And that came out in, am I correct, April of this year? Um, yeah, it came out in Holy Week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so here's the thing. This is a primer, right? And a manual of like, I mean, I consider this self-initiation this is, and I've said it to you mm. before, I mean it wholeheartedly, this is a book I wish I had written. Um, so I kind of got to go back to the drawing board now and figure out what to write about. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's really a must have, I think, particularly for all esoterically inclined Masons um, and people working within the Rosicrucian egregore. So we, you know, we, we did take a, a few questions from, from, uh, brethren and from social media followers and i kind of organized them in a way that i think feels uh pretty okay natural so maybe we can address a little bit of the trajectory of rosicrucianism was one question past present and future now i know that's a sprawling history we might yeah. you know we might want to take a look more at at maybe um or, or a closer look at maybe present and future but i i mm -hmm. leave that entirely up to you okay well, it's interesting that that question came up because, um, so I, I work with a lot of different individuals and smaller groups um, within Western esotericism. And there's one little group that identifies, it's, a, it's a, an, an informal group that basically just meets for discussion on an occasional basis. But people who are seriously involved in the Rosicrucian current and one of the things that we've been discussing is this very thing about the trajectory of Rosicrucianism and what does that suggest about how Rosicrucianism is relevant for our present times and where we may be going. And, um, and one of the things that we kind of agreed on that, we, that seemed to be a strong theme that we were all connecting with is this idea that Rosicrucianism has a history of kind of doing two things in its interaction with society at large. And one is that it kind of calls out what are the diseases or illnesses of our time. And on the other, it supports, nurtures, foments, advocates for those forces and elements in society and in personal practice that seem to offer healing to the ills of our time. And so in a way, it is at once countercultural and also supportive of things that are emerging within culture that offer healing and uh, greater levels of, of uh, peace, harmony, well-being, and so on. Um, now, if you look at when the Rosicrucian manifestos emerged, you can clearly hear them calling out uh, the, the religious tyranny of their time. Um, and 
uh, you can also hear them talking about uh, kind of lamenting the political conflict and strife, which, by the way, was just about to really reach ahead with the Thirty Years' War. And so they kind of knew that they were at this crucial transition point in European history. And, uh, and they were at once pointing out these ills of, of, of religious and political tyranny, and on the other hand, pointing to possibilities to help humanity within that context. So, for example, pointing to these ancient traditions of wisdom and knowledge and how they could illuminate um, European religion of that time how and and also integrate religion uh, to a certain degree. I mean they were bringing in elements of what many people would have regarded as foreign to their Christianity, things like uh, Kabbalah and um, and saying no look there's there's something here that we need and that will help us and um, and 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 let's let's support the investigation of that for the future. Now if we look at our current times, then you know, without getting into a lot of political conflict and 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 uh, and, and uh, differences of opinion, we could look at current times and say, yes, we can agree that one of the big problems that we're having right now is just divisiveness. That people on the left and people on the right, if you want to simplify it, put things in a binary, both agree that we're having a difficulty finding common ground and being able to work out compromises and collaborations that better serve the full spectrum of humanity. Um, and so what should Rosicrucianism be doing uh, it, right now to help us move into a future that is less divisive, less inclined to combat and conflict with each other? And one of those things is, is recognizing that our most ubiquitous common ground is nature herself. Um, and that if we can all agree to come together in respect and loving care for nature, as the book of Genesis and many other traditions tell us, that's our role as a species. If we can all come together with that agreement, then we have a common ground and a starting place for being able to work out things that are as good for as many people as possible as healing as possible. So I'll stop there, but that that's kind of my my essential reflection on the trajectory of Rosicrucianism and where we are with it. Yeah, I think that you bring up a great point with with the healing and emphasis on that because it's really, you know, um according to the the manifestos, that's like the chief goal of a Rosicrucian, right? And not only yes. that, but you're they're admonished to wear the clothing of the the place in which they live um and sort of blend in and and not necessarily flag themselves as look at me uh but <laughs> i think i think that that when i so i look at the rosicrucians like spiritual doctors mm. as you're saying you know um i i obviously i have background i had training in um well physical therapy uh, massage therapy and and uh, Chinese medicine, both traditional and classical. And um, really something that you constantly see brought up, particularly in classical Chinese medicine, is that the root cause of all illness is spiritual. And yes. a, a lot of Western allopathic medicine, and it, it's become ingrained in our culture, um, focuses on treating the symptoms. And you need to be... Um, somewhat of a physician uh in order to understand what the cause is right mm -hmm. so the, the, and and i think that that's to your point this idea that you know again this political strife this volley this divisiveness we all know something's wrong mm -hmm. we all feel it and it's just we're arguing about what's wrong and who's wrong and those are symptoms 
Those are yes. not those are not causes. You know, yes. things like you know, not not to get political, but the mundane stuff is not uh, the fact. As you brought up, that we are predisposed to combativeness. <laughs> that that's a symptom. <laughs> you know, that's a, yes, that's a huge symptom. You know, there's a cause to that 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 is it continually goes unaddressed because we focus on the most superficial layers because yes. uh, you know everything else is hard it's way harder to change yourself and your perspective and align yourself spiritually than it is to you know um walk down to the school and vote you know and and it's you know that the locus of change has to start from within so that i mean i would I would contribute that, you know, just for anybody who's listening. I think that that's an interesting point is always seek the spiritual causes. But um, we we also have some questions regarding the, uh, the I guess, Rosicrucian symbolism. And you've, you you go over um, uh, some of this stuff in, in your book, which, uh, again, I recommend. But one of the questions we had was the symbolism of the Rose Quad Jewel. Yeah. Yeah, so the 18th degree of the ancient and accepted Scottish rite is Knight Rose Qua. And the jewel is this really beautiful image of a pelican feeding its chicks with its own blood, piercing its own its breast with its beak, and then taking that blood and feeding it to its chicks. This is on a nest. And then that nest is within a set of compasses, a gold set of compasses and a quadrant. So the fourth of a circle a, looks like an arc, an upside down arc right at the bottom. And, um, and then at the top of the compasses is a crown. And um, sometimes there's a background like in... Um, Augustine Knapp's famous painting for uh, Manly P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. There's this nice watery background. Um, and uh, and that nest is very suggestive of uh, a phoenix's nest, you know, something that's ready to burst into flames and 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 uh, and bring about the process of transformation. So and then there's also typically within that, picture is some representation of the letters I-N-R-I. -I. Sometimes they're on the quadrant, sometimes they're on a banner that is beneath the quadrant or somehow within the compass compasses and the, the, uh, the quadrant. Um, on the reverse side of that jewel, oh, and by the way, behind the pelican is a cross uh, typically, it's a red cross, but not always, depending, you know, kind of on jurisdiction that can change a little bit. But there's a there's a cross back there. And um, and then on the reverse side, it's a rose cross. Then on the reverse side, there is a, that cross. And instead of the pelican, we now have an eagle. And 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 there's no chicks. There's no nest. It's just this eagle. <laughs> And um, and this can be looked at. One way of thinking about this is that the eagle represents the transformed pelican, and vice versa. Because if the eagle represents a state now of illumination and transformation, well, that's not the end goal. The end goal is, from a Rosicrucian perspective, to become a healer again within the world. And what does that mean? It means becoming the pelican once more. And um, and so those two being kind of the same side of the coin, as it were, represent these kind of two ways of being that all of us are called to serve. On the one hand, giving of our essence freely to others. Um, on the other hand, making sure that we're doing our own work to be able to realize those potentials within ourselves as fully as possible. And um, uh, so that's that's just kind of a basic view and, and interpretation of that jewel and what it represents for us as Knight's Rose Qua. 
Yeah, and I, I, I also, you know, I'm putting together uh, the, the third, the last lecture for um, Sapere Audi, and uh, the, the, the topic is Roshi Christianism and Alchemy. And um, it's really fascinating because like a, such a, lore, a large portion of, you know, the works that were attributed to Rosy Christians consists of these libraries of symbols and they're, mo mm -hmm. you know, they're largely alchemical. Um, and so I, I kind of have been, I kind of have been um, viewing pretty much all symbolism really lately through this alchemical filter. And one of the things that I noticed about the Pelican is that it's, uh, it's actually a dist it's, so there was this alchemical, this sector of alchemical tradition that would refer to specific alchemical operations based off of things that the equipment looked like. So yeah. they, they had that, the Pelican dis, distil, distiller, you know, that, that whole setup and they referred to that. So when they talk about, um, you know, the, the, the Pelican, they're referring to distillation and there are a couple yes. of, there are a couple of principles there, which is essentially, um, uh, you know, apply the application of heat fire, uh, to watery substance f towards the production of a vapor. And inside that yes. vapor, right. Is that is the essence we call it essential oils, right? That's what you get. <laughs> it, the, the essence separates and, mm -hmm. uh, and another term for, for, I guess the finished product of, of a distillation is the alchemical eagle. You know, because it, mm -hmm. it, it stores. So I, I, re I remember thinking that and being like, yeah, you know, there's so much crossover. I, I, like you could probably pull so much out of the alchemical symbols by thinking, you know, in a Rosicrucian way, because it, right. I mean, that's an obvious, as you point out in your book, it, it's, it's an obvious symbol for self sacrifice and resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. So because it's, it's that fire and that rising, right? So like you're saying, that phoenix. That new mm -hmm. thing, the, the condensed essence rising from the flames. So, yes. I mean, it's a very sophisticated system of analogy here. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and, it, and it's a very beautiful one. It's so evocative. And I think it's one that um, by, using, by using living creatures as part of this symbolism, it, it makes it evocative to, to us in a way that engages us as living creatures. You know, just think about what is it. So we can look at this pelican piercing its breast, right? And then feeding these chicks its own blood. What does that mean for me as a human being, you know, to pierce my own breast and in doing so release my own blood to then share that with others? And it's like you said, it's this process from an alchemical point of view of finding my own essence finding what it is that makes me what i am and 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 recognizing that purifying and refining that and then therefore having that to offer others it's beautiful it's just beautiful yeah and you touched on the you know inri the um inri that that's that's present there and you know, that's, that's another question that a lot of people have because that's, it's definitely recurring within Rosicrucianism. And I enjoyed the fact that in your book, you use the alchemical translation, right? Because I think, you know, it, in traditional Orthodox um, Christianity, I think it's uh, like Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. Um, that's Jesus it. Nazareth. But, but you, you point out that the alchemical translation is igni natura renovator integra right the um the the that, yes that's one of them nature, the whole of nature is renovated renovated by the fire so that's i mean that plays in right there to what we're talking about yes yes that's right and there are other interpretations esoteric interpretations of that acronym and um and so one of the important things about that is that that acronym does serve as a bridge between the clear kind of religious origin of, of the acronym INRI and the alchemical significance. It, it bridges and brings those two together. And one of the ways that we can kind of think of 
Rosicrucian spirituality is that it's really where uh, alchemy and and the psycho spiritual way of looking at alchemy, those things, that's where that really started to happen in the history of Europe is in the Rosicrucian movement. Um, it wasn't so much psychological because psychology as we know it today hasn't hadn't yet really been developed. It was more spiritual alchemy that was developing then within the Rosicrucian movement uh, and in response to the Rosicrucian movement. And, and INRI serves as an acronym then in different ways to help us understand how those two things can be brought together. And, and, is involved in certain practices, some that I include in my book, um, as a way of contemplatively, ritually, devotionally engaging in that connection between that alchemical approach to transformation and the spirituality of the Christian tradition. Yeah, that's a great point, you know, to, to point out to people that it's it was really not psychology didn't exist back then the way we understand it because a lot of this stuff does get like you know f put through that filter in in the yes. modern, when people are trying to analyze it they're like well this probably has something to do but not necessarily um another question that we had that that is kind of close to my own heart right um really great question i think rosicrucian and eastern traditions do you think that they're combat compatible or or can eastern practitioners appreciate uh the rosicrucian war yeah i will just say that i know some eastern practitioners who definitely appreciate the rosicrucian egregor who see in it um a transcendence of the kind of literal use of the religious language in christianity and recognize in it the um the embrace of the great mystery uh, in a way that, you know, isn't limited to this kind of view of God as a bearded old man in the sky, you know, making judgments about what er everything people do and, you know, don't do. And, um, uh, and Easterners who also recognize in the Rosicrucian tradition the significance of shifting consciousness um, of practicing contemplative methods that put us in a different uh, state of consciousness give us a different perspective on our being and our, our existence and open our consciousness up to other ways of knowing which is all things that are kind of done out in the open more in what we would kind of you know, classify as Eastern or Asian traditions. They haven't had to make those things quite as esoteric as we have in the Western world. They haven't had the kind of religious persecution uh, that we've experienced in the Western world. And so to be able to find that in the Western world is uh, a way of saying, see, there's humanity as a whole. There's this deep spirituality that we can all relate to and connect with. And that brings us together, that bridges the East-West divide and ultimately kind of makes it questionable how much sense it is, to how much sense there is in saying East versus West. Right, right yeah. absolutely. And that's the, that's the thing that I've experienced is I, I do have to, I do find myself having to make that um, distinction to, I would say like, you know, entry level sort of, or, or people just getting interested in this stuff because it, the, at a certain point, yeah, you get, if you've been in this long enough and you sort of traverse into both realms, I kind of happenstantially did that because I was initiated into the golden dawn when I started going to school for Chinese medicine. So it just kind of <laughs> happened together. But, um, uh, you know, once you've been in it for a while, you can sort of exchange uh, symbol systems to a degree. And I find mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. most most in common with esoteric Taoism, because a lot of their, you know, uh, nadon, you know, their internal alchemical formulas are based on alchemical yes. analogies. But so that when I'm looking for, for uh, you know, a way to transpose 
my energy practice that I acquired through Taoist Qigong and things like that. Okay, I want to I want to use this in a Western setting. The 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 area where I find they intersect is alchemy, right? That's that's common to both, mm-hmm. both, both mm-hmm. traditions. Yeah, I I mean I agree with you. One of my teachers in 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 Western her, uh, esotericism, particularly Hermetic Kabbalah, was also uh, you know also practiced qigong and uh, and had a deep appreciation for Taoist philosophy. I've always had a deep appreciation for it, and and certainly, I think we can see to go back to the beginning of our conversation how the yin yang symbol right um, and and then the concept of Tai Chi is an expression of non-dualism. It's like, yes, we can see and experience duality within this one thing, right? And that one thing, we can call it something. We can call it the way or the truth or the Tao or whatever, but that's not what it really is. We have well, to acknowledge that, that it's a mystery. That's that's the beginning of the Tao Te Ching, right? The Tao that yes. has a name is not the true Tao, is not the eternal Tao. So he's basically exactly. starting the whole Lao starting the whole thing off saying like, look, I'm going to talk about this, but it, I, there's no way to talk about this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Take what follows here, take with a huge grain of salt. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's that. And there's one other thing I want to say on this particular thing. And that is that, When I first started my disciplined practice of inner work um, with one of my teachers who was a philosophy professor, the method that he taught in terms of like meditation and doing energy work and all of that was actually from yoga. It was it was a kind of form of kundalini yoga. Um, using the chakras and seed mantras associated with that and doing pranayama and so on and and chanting uh, those seed mantras both internally and externally. And, and I, I don't need to go into all the detail. But my point is, is that then when I moved into the Western esoteric tradition and began following the methods that um, were popularized through the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, one might even say created within the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, like the middle pillar exercise, I immediately was at home. You know, I what I had been doing in that Kundalini yoga practice and what I started doing with middle pillar work, I mean, it's virtually identical. And I've heard people from Vajrayana Buddhism say very similar things. Yeah, the, the it's very interesting. The um, there's also uh, you know, there is that in 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 Taoist forms of energy work as well. You've got mm-hmm. essentially they boil it down to three major centers called the Dantian. So there's you know an upper, middle, and a lower. This uh, really the the triple heater. But so mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, I, I I was learning those two things at the same time, and 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 right, and so what is and then combining that in alchemy, you've got if you've got those three centers, you've got salt, sulfur, and mercury. You have the tree of prima right there on the on the middle <laughs> pillar, which is something I'm working on. I'm writing a book on this, so, <laughs> so nobody steal my ideas. But no, it's it, <laughs> it, it's really it, it's it's a it's um I think that yeah they're 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 interchangeable, but kind of like you're saying, right? You you had a teacher that taught you this stuff, and then you you went over to the the Western and you were at home. So you, I think that, um, you know, you need to, because there's a tendency when you begin, when you start out to have everything needs to be a one-to-one, right? Yes. Like, so you've got yeah. five centers on the middle pillar of the Kabbalistic tree, but you've got seven chakras. So people are just kind of like, well, does this fit? And they're just trying to jam a square peg into a round hole. And so there's, there's a bit of right that, which is something that I think, you know, that, that to me, it characterizes your writing is that like, let's not just talk about this. Let's go and do this right? because then yes. <laughs> that's how you're going to understand it. You can't understand yes. it by reading it. No, esotericism is not a connect the dots game. Um, esotericism, if it's really going to be uh, given its due, 
must be practiced. You got to do this work and you can't dabble, skip around. You know, you hear a lot about the, the evils of dabbling. Um, I wouldn't necessarily refer to it in terms of evils, but what happens when you don't commit to a particular course of inner work and you try to do a little of this and a little of that is that it gets watered down. It's like, I'm going to be a little bit of a guitar player and a little bit of a flute player and a little bit of a drummer, but I'm never really going to have all the time and energy to do one of those instruments as well as possible and then maybe pick up the, you know, another instrument. The same thing is true for, for this work, and we have to do it or else it's, it's just another set of information that we can kind of take some pleasure in playing with, but never really applying in a deep, meaningful way. Yeah, the music analogy is great. That's I think that that's something that's very accessible that will that will turn a lot of people's like like light a light bulb in their head. You know, because because master musicians, when you master an instrument, you you're going to be better most of the time out of the gate. Like if I went, you know, I'd been playing drums for, for 15 years, playing guitar for 15 years, and I go to sit behind another instrument, it's going to come more naturally. You mm -hmm. know, I might, I might not be able to play like uh, at a, at a, the level of a virtuoso, but the baseline makes that like my baseline understanding of the mechanics of music and my instrument as, as it relates to this one, it's going to, to, to give me, you know, firmer footing than somebody who had kind of like jumped around. That's a really great example. Yeah. Um, a really great question that I wanted to make sure that, that, that we get in here today is uh, especially, you know, I have, I've done some work lately on Freemasonry um, very, very near and dear to my heart. And a lot of that was, you know, um, your book was a, was a tremendous help in, in researching it. One of the things that I, that I, you know, I run into without fail is like, where's the feminine component in Freeman mm -hmm. Mason? We mm -hmm. had, we had, a, um, you know, a, all sort of like, you know, rationale behind, uh, uh, you know, a modern fraternal institution, moving that aside, I wanted to address the question of the divine feminine, or as, as somebody put it here, the Sophianic elements in mm -hmm. Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics, too. And I've done a lot of work with this, not just in terms of like reading to see what other people say and doing symbol interpretation, but I've actually done some inner work with this. And I think there's some really uh, strong elements there that can be very transformative for any Mason. And so let me just kind of highlight some places where I think symbolically we can see the divine feminine peeking through. Um, I will start with the celestial and ter terrestrial globes at the tops of our two pillars, Boaz, and what we typically say in Texas is Jockin. And, um, and if we look at these, what we have is um, essentially the the firmament and the the earth this is one way of of thinking about this in greek terms is gaia and chronos and gaia is a goddess and so the terrestrial globe at the top of one of these pillars is a representation of that divine feminine being identified with earth herself, with nature in its material manifestation on planet earth. And the masculine then being identified with the celestial and that overarching kind of order that transcends the earth. So that's one way it shows up. For me, there are two other and and personally more significant ways that I find the divine feminine peeking through. And one is with all this talk of the widow that we do in the Masonic tradition. 
uh, you know, we refer to the chief architect of the temple, Hiram Abiff, as a widow's son. And, um, and, and, and we acknowledge that she was um, Jewish. She was an Israelite. Um, and, uh, and yet she's a widow. And, and why is that? Well, I'm actually working on another book. Uh, in which I kind of address this in terms of the eighth degree of the Scottish Rite, where there's a lot of symbolism that I think plays into this. But I'm going to bridge over, I'm going to make a huge leap, and yet one that isn't disconnected to the, the primary symbol that I think connects masonry with the divine feminine, and that's the blazing star. The blazing star is... Uh, is an emblem of what we would call in the Judeo-Christian tradition of Shekinah, of the divine presence, the glory of God to which all our labors are supposed to be dedicated as Freemasons. Um, we talk about the blazing star as an emblem of truth, of divine truth, um, and the light of divine truth. And what are we seeking? We're seeking light. And the blazing star is, is the symbol of that. Well, Shekinah, to go back to the Judeo-Christian tradition, is at once the wisdom of God, which is spoken of in Proverbs, she speaks of herself as divine wisdom, and she talks about how she was there at the beginning. Before anything was created, she was there, and that she served as the master worker, the master architect for the divine, right? And um, very clearly personified as she. So that's... And then there are many other th other ways that Shekinah shows up. She's the presence that the high priests of Israel invokes upon the mercy seat, that the visible presence of the divine. Uh, she's the presence that guides the nation of Israel in its wanders through the desert for 40 years as a pillar of smoke during the day and a pillar of flame at night. So she's all of these things and more. And what do we do? When we represent the opening of a lodge on the altar, we bring together the square and the compass in a way that makes a star. It can be looked at as a five-pointed star. It can be looked at as a six-pointed star, depending upon how the square and compass are connected with each other. That's the moment of invoking the blazing star, the Shekinah, on the altar. She's now present. We're aware of her presence. She's always present. Now we're aware of it. We've recognized her, and we've consecrated and sanctified this space to interact with her and to know the divine more fully through each other and our interaction with each other in that sacred space. Um. And so what is that then? The lodge itself is a womb, right? <laughs> it's a liminal space. It's it's a womb. And the Scottish Rite degree, degrees are full of these spaces, wombs and tombs and catacombs, these places where rebirth happens and something is nurtured to be brought forth new into the world. So as you can tell, this is a very exciting, engaging topic for me. And I'm so glad we get to speak about this because it doesn't often come up. And, um, and I really appreciate you asking this question. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it is really important to, to examine the, the balance, the dipole that masonry is constantly presenting to us. And then it's kind of reconciliation by, by a kind of marriage, like you're, you, you're kind of talking about there with the compass and squares. It's, I remember my first sort of venture into a Masonic hall. They had this one particular G uh, with the square and compasses. I, I don't even think it was in the lodge. I think it was in the office. But the first thing that I saw was that dead space in the air in the middle 
this, it's silhouetted almost perfectly. This is my Eastern, you know, sort of prior training, perfectly silhouetted, uh, silhouetted the lingam and the yoni right there yes. in, in the center of the square and cup. Like, that's, <laughs> that's Vedic. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. And, and, and another, another thing to your point is, yeah, right. The, because the, the verbiage that this, that the inquirer used here is uh, Sophianic and you brought that, you know, to, to bear in, in the, the Shekinah, right. Being mm -hmm. wisdom, the female counterpart of, of logos. That's who Sophia is almost uniformly. Um, you know, in the apocryphal book, The Wisdom of Solomon, it, it specifically says that Solomon, you know, uh, and it's a turn of phrase, but but it's interesting that he says uh, Solomon desired to take wisdom for a bride, right? Yes, <laughs> it's good. And who? I mean, that's a central part of of Blue Lodge Freemasonry, and even into you know uh, the York Rite and, and Royal Arch is the you know t King Solomon's right at the the forefront and the the temple but very very um i am glad that we got to to touch on that i think you, you've and you certainly got enough there to even maybe write another book about, about that. well yeah I, like i said it there will be i will be addressing this in more detail in a forthcoming book there's one other thing i want to say about that before we move on and that is uh this this sophianic presence <clears throat> also is about mother nature which is Gaia, you know. So it's also about Mother Nature. Um, and uh, and what is Masonry? One of the big things that Masonry teaches us to do is to be observers of nature, to, to adore nature, because within her we see the handiwork of the Creator. And so that's just another aspect of the Divine Feminine that I did want to highlight before we move on. Yeah. And another thing for me is, uh, which will tie into the the next question. I've got, I've got like two more. Um, being in that in that you know liminal space of of the the preparation room as well in in darkness, you know, uh, it, that to me seems like a, a womb too. And you had mentioned you know wombs and tombs, and uh, yeah, being sort of being released from that that amniotic space of the the uh the the earthen world and then moving forward uh into the yes. light into the light seems like a birthing but at the same time yes. we, know, we know that there's also right from what just from what we're talking about sacrifice and resurrection regeneration there's also a death involved so yes. so the next question that somebody wanted us to address is this, this whole idea of death in esotericism. Mm. I mean, that's a pretty, that's a pretty broad, you know, stroke, <laughs> but I'm wondering what your, what some of your most immediate thoughts are. Yeah. So, um, so there are two, I think, general categories that I would I would say my thoughts about death in Western esotericism and within masonry in particular fall. And one is, on the one hand, reflecting on the inevitability of our physical demise. You know, the awareness of that is an important part of the transformational process. Um, and we can go into more detail about how that awareness works what is its alchemy and what does it do to us? And then the other category is um, the little mini deaths that we have to experience through the transformative process. The letting go of the way we used to conceive of ourselves, the letting go of allowing things to pass away that we used to believe were supremely important. Um, you know, letting go of things that we now realize were just illusions and complete bullshit, you know. Each of those things is a kind of death, and with them can come both a grieving process and a liberation. And um, and so those are the two basic categories, and I don't know which one of those you want to jump into, but I'd love to, I'd love to, to go further into that if you want. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think that what we've what we've kind of done, uh, 
you know, unintentionally is we've kind of circled back to what we were talking about, you know, in the beginning of the, of the conversation is that this idea of, of having, I mean, what is it, but a kind of death, what what we were talking about earlier, this, you know, non-experience experience. experience that nice then, connection. Right. You have to then go back and relearn how to be in the world. Like exactly what you're saying, get rid of the bullshit and, and, and approach this stuff. So, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's an interesting um, direction to go to. I, I think, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 I don't even know if this is an appropriate term, but, but the one to the other is kind of like this microcosm and macrocosm, those lesser mm. death and greater death. Um, if, just to sort of, I'm, I don't know, cr- create an, an, an analogy to refer to them. And I think that, you know, we see a lot of that, particularly in esotericism. Um, this idea that you kind of, what we were talking about before, you die once. And then it's, you know, it's totally new, but really I think it's a series of little deaths. Like you're talking about, you know, you yeah. die many times, you know, yes, despite yourself. And, and, you know, as you were saying, there, there are different reactions to that. Uh, the thing that, that, that I bring, that I kind of struggled with just to, to, um, you know, be uh, straightforward or, or to be honest it's that whole uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, the five stages of death and dying. When I underwent the sort of like my, um, you know, big initiation, uh, I did go. I found myself going through those those you know like um, denial and and mm-hmm. shock and like resistance. Right? You spend like some people can spend a, a really long time in the resistance period as well. <laughs> I don't know if you've yeah. experienced that oh yeah yeah for sure yeah i think all of us experience resistance in multiple ways and sometimes we're conscious of it very often we're not aware of it until all of a sudden you know the scales are removed from our eyes and we go oh crap i've been i've been resisting this you know i see now how i've been resisting this change this transformation all this time because oh you know fact was i wasn't ready for it yet yeah, I mean, so it's there are psychological components, but I mean, how do you view that death spiritually, right? Because we were talking about mm-hmm. how it's it's not necessarily psychological, but then everything that we're kind of talking about has to do with you know the conscious processing of of yes. this thing. How would you conceptualize it spiritually? Yeah, well, first of all, I will start off by saying that I don't think we can we can ultimately divide the psychological from the spiritual. Um, I think that we can kind of artificially put those as two separate categories that kind of can be useful to us in some ways, but ultimately they're, everything is spiritual. The psychological, the material, the social, everything is ultimately spiritual to me. Yeah, that's that panentheism you were mentioning. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. And so, um, but to try to answer your question in a way that actually deals with these as two categories, I would say that that spiritual death is ultimately the letting go of the surrender of this illusion that I am a separate individual entity existing uh, on its own within a context of others. And um, uh, because that that's the basic illusion that creates all of the other illusions that begets all of the other problems and complications in life. Um and 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 at its at its core that's something that transcends our psychology or you could say is deeper than our psychology and um and when that happens when you realize that 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 what i think of as myself that my self concept and and my self image and all of my memories and all of that stuff is um, is all 
a transitory passing thing, passing things um, that seem to have accumulated in a way that, you know, has, has its own identity, that that's all going to dissolve and pass away and maybe even experience that in an altered state of consciousness experience that dissolution and you realize that all of this psychology that you thought you were is is just gone that's what i would categorize then as the spiritual death this is that and it involves both the letting go and also the liberation because you realize then oh my gosh what I really am is so much more and uh, and isn't constrained by all of that psychology and all of that history and all of those notions about how I'm different and what makes me unique and all of those. And then you come back to it and you can actually enjoy the beauty of those things even more and be less disturbed by how... Uh, challenging and difficult and limited it is it just becomes uh another expression of the divine that you can appreciate like so many other expressions of the divine in this magnificent tapestry of existence that we share yeah that's a good point to highlighting how how the two right are, are really one side or two sides of one coin but it's it's just so interesting that you know that that psychology component is ultimately what dissolves like you you put it which is yeah it's kind of funny <laughs> terrifying but funny um i i think <laughs> i think one of the last questions uh that we had was taking a a deeper look at some of the practices in mm. uh, in the new book so i don't know if you had anything in particular i know you had uh, like a sort of a rosary kind of um exercise i have uh, a couple of those yeah yeah you've got middle pillars and things like that so but i didn't know if there was anything that you wanted to talk about in in regards to well maybe you know in in terms of you know heading towards that that spiritual kind of let's let's put it death really a rebirth right what are mm -hmm. what are some of the practices that he, that you think you would utilize? Would they be most practical or useful in in preparing somebody for that? Yeah, so there's there's an interesting kind of of um, what might seem contradictory elements to bring together in preparing for that kind of of event um, that that transformative event that we've been talking about, and one is that it's really helpful to integrate the different elements of the self as well as possible, um, which kind of seems like it might be contradictory to what we're trying to do. So if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to bring myself together in a more structured and ordered way, wouldn't that seem to be kind of counter to this idea of the dissolution of the self? Um, and on the surface, yes, you would say they those those two do contradict each other. However, what that ordering process does is it enables the movement of energies through us uh, and the harmonization of our being uh, so that we can resonate with higher levels of, of consciousness we'll just say being we could use other terms that we can resonate with those higher levels of consciousness and it's like we're we're making our our individual being more of a tuning fork that resonates with that more pure vibration that more that purer frequency and um the white light instead of all the different rays of colors. Um, so that then once we brought all of those colors or all of those frequencies into harmony with each other, then boom, the pure sound 
what the Pythagoreans might call the music of the spheres um, or the pure white light on the other side of the prism. Boom, there it is. And it's undeniable from that point forward. And, um, and so um, Yeah, so I think I'll stop right there, Ike, and, and give you an opportunity to, to bounce off of that. I, there might be some more of the things that I could say, but I really want to highlight that, that these exercises are designed to bring together and integrate the different energies and faculties of our being so that we can resonate uh, with these kind of higher vibrations and yeah. let them then that that becomes the transformative process. Right. That's that's a huge thing is that you don't so we talk a lot about balance and imbalance and I like to you know when I was in PT doing postural assessments you tell somebody to stand straight and go like this it's like well that's not that's not straight. <laughs> you know like you you just you have to kind of feel your way to that balance mm -hmm. and, and and we live in a realm that is nothing is truly static so it's a it's a dynamic equilibrium there is no mm -hmm. true stasis mm -hmm. true no true middle you know you're just kind of the 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 compression and rarefaction to use like a you know an audio term because i'm a musician it just it starts out real wide and then it thins right yeah <laughs> and and um but yeah a big process in that right if you're if you're polarized towards one end or the other, the middle is not going to look like the middle to you. It's going to look <laughs> like you're always going to be facing your opposite. You know, that's yes. a huge problem we have today is that people think they're back. Very much so. Because they're not, it's an interior thing. Like you're saying, it's yeah. this it's this music, you know, that mm -hmm. that, that, that you, you just hear. And, and, and part of that, yeah, transforms the way that we see everything. Um, and it's that is why the outer order of the golden dawn right the pre rosicrucian section of it it has an alchemical initiatic formula um in order to uh, the verbiage is from the z documents when when a hierophant is, is is initiating the whole idea is that you want to strengthen the weak in that candidate's sphere of sensation and purify the strong. Yes. So that's you know that's that's another that's another way of saying balance them. And yes. what, what we would consider that is the it's extremely hermetic because it's the rectification of the sphere of sensation. Um, mm -hmm. And and, and uh, some people might have a stronger Gebura influence, and some people might have a stronger Yesod influence. You know, God help us. <laughs> but, um, it, it, you you want to you know in the outer order the magic is done to you in the inner yes. order which is rosy christian you're doing the magic um right and, but that's exactly what you're talking about is the is the hermetic rectification of the sphere of sensation is making the microcosm more like the macrocosm you know the in terms of the blueprint you know um and how that's right things always work things are always connected and and it's it's you know it's not a lot of, like, like a lot of people think they come in with this white light spirituality and they think it's like well i have to shrink gebura no you just have to connect it right via that reciprocal path right to, you know to to hesed you have to connect mercy and severity and what happens when they meet in the middle beauty right so yes not about getting rid of the Gibura aspect. We need the Gibura aspect. But so so this is one way in which like modern initiates are really challenged because they don't have a sense of um what balance is, where the middle is. And and there's definitely this kind of in, in spiritual circles, I don't know if you found the same, but there's this knee-jerk reaction against the confrontational, which which has to happen. You know, I if yeah. I could, if I had to sum up the 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 initiatic journey, it would be in confrontation. You know, yeah. so, a lot of it's self confrontation. But. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. We um, 
We need to have opportunities to look into the mirror. This is one of the reasons why the, uh, you know, the master apprentice relationship is so important or the mentor mentee relationship is so important. Teacher student. This is one of the reasons why that relationship is so important is because after you've built the rapport that is necessary that, you know, for, for this sort of thing, then you have the opportunity for someone you trust and respect and recognize that they're further along than you are. You have the opportunity for them to hold up a mirror to you and it not be something that you immediately fight back defensively against. You go, oh, okay, I'm going to look there and whether I, you know, like what I see or not, I'm going to recognize it. And um, and so, yes, that's one of the, the reasons for these important relationships, which then by extension go out into being part of a group, a part of an order or a lodge or a temple or a sangha in the Buddhist tradition. Right. And uh, and, you know, and and there's this record of the Buddha talking about how important that communal experience is. And that without that communal experience, all the other efforts that we make can actually lead us astray. Um, because in the language of Masonic ritual, we are social beings. I mean, you look at the beehive lecture for those who have that as part of their jurisdiction's ritual. You look at what our ritual says about the sense of hearing, for example, in the fellowcraft degree. Both of those are really clear statements about our nature as social beings. That's how we were created. That's how we've evolved. And if we don't engage ourselves in that spiritually and allow the feedback loops that can develop through that, then we're not going to get that kind of harmony that we, you and I have been talking about. We're not ultimately going to get that just by doing the work on our own. Now, I suppose maybe if you think in terms of reincarnation, there may be human beings that come into physical a physical manifestation in a life where they really need more isolation than others do for some reason or another. But even in isolation, there's still community. And and the and and people who have gone on extended periods of hermitage no, they often come back talking about having a deeper understanding and appreciation of community. I mean, look, Jesus comes back from the wilderness. Buddha comes back from his aesthetic practice, you know, all alone out there in the forest. The same, Muhammad does a very similar thing. So there are these, these great stories about how we need to engage with others. And um, and so I'm glad you made that point. One of the other things I would like to say now about m the practices in the book and how they move us in that direction of, 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 of recognizing this oneness of all things and that, that quintessential death that we were talking about is that I've got lots of exercises in there that are about harmonizing these different elements of our being. Lots of exercises about that. I've got a series of alchemically oriented exercises that are about actually breaking down the psychology and recognizing its different elements and realigning them in a way that's more harmonious and integrated. It takes several months to do that, even if you did it as quickly as possible. Um, and, uh, and yet, all of these exercises point to, if not include, movement toward deep silence and stillness, deep, open silence and stillness, like a tomb, making yourself this open, empty availability for the divine to make itself known and to transform you in ways that you can't do for yourself. Duality cannot make itself unity. Only unity can transform duality into oneness. That's a wonderful way to put that. Um, 
last the last thing I want to ask you is if you have anything um, in the works or coming down the pipe that you'd like to talk about or mention. Well, I did talk about this other book that I'm working on. I uh, I'm working now on a book that looks at the Blue Lodge degrees primarily, but then also some Scottish Rite degrees as well, particularly the eighth degree, um, to recognize masonry's potential to serve as a system of mystical practice, uh, of, of realizing our oneness with the divine. And, um, and to and to go directly toward that with as little of the other things that get associated with mystical work uh, as possible. Um, and, and one of the things that I know you resonate very well with is this idea of, of platonic mysticism and how so much of, of Western mysticism, no matter whether you're looking at it through a Jewish lens, a Christian lens, a Muslim lens, Baha'i, whatever, we find the influence, at the very least, the influence of Platonic mysticism on these different traditions. So it makes sense to look at masonry through this lens because it's not limited to a particular religious context. <clears throat> it's a philosophical context that has influenced all of these great religions. And, and when you do that, what does it say? What does it suggest about the journey that masonry provides for us? Um, and, um, and how can that transformation be facilitated so that through Freemasonry, we can come to this awareness of our oneness with the divine and everything else? Um, and, um, and that's what this next book will be about. And I hope to have it out maybe about this time a little earlier, hopefully next year. So, uh, so people can keep their eyes open for it. Great. I'm looking forward to everything else that you've got for us in the future. And I appreciate so much uh, your willingness to sit down with me today and, and have this conversation. This has been fantastic. Um, and thank you for coming on. And obviously, as you already probably understand, it's an open door. Whenever you want to come talk, I'd love to have you. Oh, thank you so much, Ike. I really appreciate the time that we've had here together. I've enjoyed just getting to bounce some things around with you a little bit. And, uh, you know, uh, I enjoy the, the kind of resonance that I feel with you. There's so many things that, that we agree on, and yet there are times when you say things that put a little different spin on things, and that's good for me. And I really appreciate that. And I know that you are gaining a following of people who can see how much you bring that's a value to all of these subjects and, uh, and, and rightly so. I appreciate that. that I mean, that's uh, the highest compliment that I can get. And I think much like yourself, my goal is in, 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 in sort of having these conversations, right? I mean, one of the things that that I, I got really at the outset was like, this is, this isn't an interview. I don't interview people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I like to have conversations because I think that what is going to, uh, I think a meeting of the minds is always something that is incredible. And I've stumbled across some of the most mind blowing things, even if I didn't realize it, right. Like maybe a week later it connects yeah. from a conversation. Yeah. And one of the things that I try to do much like yourself, just in this format, is present the listener with as many different kind of ideas and really unfold a topic that they can go off and, and think about. So uh, that's why yeah. I love having people like yourself on. I know I can do that with, I know, you know, um, that you're going to lead the conversation in a really uh, interesting and, and, and pertinent way, you know, especially yourself where it's like this um, admonishment to practice, to practice, to mm, practice. Mm. It's it's something that I think really it cannot be understa uh, overstated at this time. So I appreciate you again, and I'm looking forward to, to our next combo. Thank you. Thank you, brother.